naturally speaking, why do stars end up in the black hole? Why do they wander? It's usually because, in fact, it's always because of the interference of another star that gets in their field and pushes them off course. So we always want to be careful about associations. We want to be fixed in our doctrine so that, you know, another star doesn't push us off course. Amen? Well, good to be back. This is kind of fun being gone, but it's, it's good to be back. Just a little over two weeks to Christmas, believe it or not. Being in London and Canterbury kind of put us in the Christmas spirit. In fact, uh, we were in the Canterbury Cathedral this past week, and we were there in time for the Feast of St. Nicholas, whatever that is about. <laughs> I don't know if that's Santa Claus or uh, St. Nicholas might be the, the one who wrote uh, Silent Night. I don't think it would be Nicholas the proselyte, but um, any may, anyway, it was fun. Um, but this morning, I'd like to turn our attention to John chapter 1. And I'm, as far as England goes, Sister Debbie Clark is going to give her first-hand account of that when she recovers and probably next Sunday night. So we're looking at John, John's Gospel, chapter 1. And being that this is a season to celebrate Christ, his first coming. I don't think there's another chapter in Holy Writ that gives us as many descriptions and titles as to whom Christ was as we find in John's Gospel in chapter 1. And many of these descriptions repeat throughout this chapter. Now, we know that Christ was fully God and fully man. God has to become man so that he can die. God cannot die, so he has to become man. So that he can take our place, so that he can be a sacrifice for us. So he comes to earth, he becomes man. And also because he has to put on flesh and blood so he can feel the infirmity, weakness, temptation of mankind so that when he ascends back, he can be a merciful high priest. He has been there and done that. He hasn't done that, I should say. He's felt the temptation of mankind, yet without yielding to it, but he knows what man goes through. Now, this issue, the God-man issue, has been kind of a big issue throughout centuries. In fact, even in one of the early church councils in Chalcedon, 451 AD, they were still debating this issue about whether God was fully man and fully God. And um, it seems as though this has been an issue through the ages. In fact, um, even the Islam, even Muslims, they accept Christ as a prophet, but they do not accept him as the Son of God. They do not accept him as God. Now, if you only had one chapter in the Bible to base your defense, you're going to, you know, experience this ministry of apologetics, and you're going to defend the God man issue if you only had one chapter to work from, it would have to be John's Gospel in chapter 1. Now I'm going to read about a dozen descriptions that you find in this chapter. And then we'll read through the chapter and expound on a few of them. I don't have time to do all of that this morning, but we'll expand on a few of them. And as I always say, it's a different exercise this morning. When I don't have a lot to say, I like to read a lot of scriptures to kind of, uh, you know, cover me here. 
But in this chapter, we see Christ as the Word. The Word was God. We see him as the beginning. He's described as the beginning of all things. We see him as the creator. Nothing made without him. He is described as life itself. In him was life. He was the essence. He is the essence of life. We see him as the true light. Light of every man that comes into the world. We see him as the God-man, the word becoming flesh, God becoming man. We see him as the only begotten. He's the firstborn. He was before all things. He is called the Lamb of God. He's going to be the sacrifice. Many titles and descriptions of Christ in this chapter. He is called Rabbi, with a capital R, being interpreted Master. He's called the Master. And, of course, one of the debates was, was is he that prophet? They were talking about the prophet from Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. He is also called the Messiah, the Christ, in this chapter. He is called the Son of God in this chapter. He's called the King of Israel in this chapter. And he's called the Son of Man. So all of this is within chapter 1. <clears throat> now, uh, I want to read the whole chapter. I won't do this again. I rarely read this much scripture on a Sunday morning, but I want to come back maybe several more uh, sessions on this. And so I'm just going to read the whole chapter through. So if you have it on the overhead, it's a familiar chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light that was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You might want to underscore some of these. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. In other words, they were born of the Spirit. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of Him and cried, saying, This was He of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And of course, John actually was born before Christ, but he is talking about the one who came after him that was before him, pre existence. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man hath seen God at any time. 
the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. They asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they asked him and said unto him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And for your information, Bethabara was the place where Israel crossed into the promised land. It means house of passage. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel, therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, after John stood, and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and saith unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. This is the anointed one. This is the one that we've been looking for. And he brought him to Jesus and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. He knew all their names in advance, didn't he? Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew, and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael, and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending 
upon the Son of Man. Kind of a long chapter, a lot to meditate upon in this chapter. <clears throat> now, obviously, we cannot expound, expound upon this whole reading, but we see many descriptions of Christ in this chapter, many titles given to Christ in this chapter. So we want to just consider a few of these, and then maybe we'll return to this again in our next session. But let's begin with Christ. This is, let us begin with Christ as the beginning, because he was the beginning, and as the word and as the only begotten. So we're going to mesh some of these thoughts together here. And we'll reiterate a few more verses looking back now. So first of all, let's go back to verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. Let's look at verse 14. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 15 again. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. As we said, John was actually born before Christ, but as the scripture tells us here, he that cometh after me is preferred before me because he was before me. He was from everlasting. And verse 18, no man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The only begotten who was in the bosom of the Father. And then verse 30 again, this is he of whom I said after me cometh a man which is preferred before me for he was before me. He was before me. Now what all of these verses are telling us is that before there was anything else there was Christ. You know we want to be clear on this because as I said Islam which is a growing menace in the world and taking a lot of people. You know, they accept Christ as a prophet, but they don't accept him as the Son of God. I remember a story once Pastor Bailey was telling us when he was in a Muslim country, and they said, now you want to be very careful here because the Muslims accept Christ Christ as a prophet, but they don't accept him as the Son of God. And so Pastor Bailey was very careful to tell them that Jesus Christ was more than a prophet. He was the Son of God. <clears throat> so Christ was the beginning of all things. Now let's shift over to 1 John. This is not the Gospel, the 1 John. One, one. And John begins kind of the same way here. First John, one, one. He says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, he's alluding to Christ here, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. He's talking about Christ who was from the beginning, we have seen him with our eyes. We've heard him with our ears. Our hands have touched him. The one that was from the beginning. Revelation 1.8. I told you I had a lot of verses here. so Revelation 1.8. And this is Christ who says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning. And the ending saith the Lord, which is, which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Well, we all recognize that word Alpha, don't we? 
we recognize the word alpha bet, right? Well, the word alpha is the first letter in the Greek alphabet. And omega is the last letter in the Greek alphabet. He says, I'm the first, I'm the last, I'm A to Z. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. So we get the correct perspective. You know, sometimes we don't teach these things to the church, but we want to be grounded in our faith. Christ was from everlasting. Before there was anything else, there was Christ. From the beginning of time. Let's look at another verse in John 3. I'm sorry, Revelation 3. Verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, if I, I think that this verse is a little misleading because it gives us the impression that Christ was created. Satan was created. Christ was not created. He stepped forth out of the bosom of the Father and everything was made through him. And so I'm going to read from several other translations, the modern King James, which says it a little bit better. You might want to note this because Christ was not created. But looking at John 3, 14, it looks as though, you know, he was created. So in John 3, 14, looking at the new uh, or the modern King James, it says... Um, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write the amen, the faithful and true witness, the head of the creation of God says these things. The head of the creation. And then also, just to give you another one here, in the international standard it reads like this. And I just want us to be clear that Christ was not created, but he was the creator, he was the co-creator. So looking at the International Standard, it says, uh, to the messenger, uh, sorry, messenger of the church in Laodicea, write the amen, the faithful, uh, the witness who is faithful and true, the originator of God's creation says this, the originator of God's creation. That's better because he wasn't created. He stepped out of the very bosom of the Father. He was uh, the originator. Everything that was created came through him. So we have to understand that he's very God who became very man. Very God and very man. Amen? So before there was anything else, there was Christ who stepped out of the bosom of the Father. And with that thought, let's move to Proverbs chapter 8, because here you have kind of a picture of Christ stepping out of the bosom of the Father before the creation, and uh, I realize this personification of wisdom here in Proverbs 8, but um, looking at Proverbs 8, 22 through 24, and, and it would be good if you just read the whole thing through on your own, we don't have time for all these verses, but um, it begins, the Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. You see him in the bosom of the Father from the beginning. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning or ever the earth was, was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, he was brought forth before anything was made. So, uh, you know, as I said, it might be good if you read through the whole chapter, but he stepped out of the bosom of the Father back in time. Now, as you study the Godhead, of course, the Godhead is speaking of the Trinity or the three in one, you find that there was perfect harmony uh, between the members of the Godhead perfect unity, affability, that there was no dissension at all and that God had they moved together as a unit. And in fact, Jesus prayed for the church after this manner, that, that 
God would grant the church to be in the same unity as he and the Father were. Now, I'll tell you something. If you look out there at the church world today, you don't see that, do you? But it has to come to pass. The church that's going up has to come into a, a union and communion with, them, with each other and with God that they have never known before. So there's perfect um, affability, perfect submission. You know, Jesus said, my father is greater than I. God is the head of Christ. And yet there was perfect submission, perfect affability. Uh, I mean, here in the husband-wife relationship, you know, that's the way it's supposed to be. Paul brings it out. There should be perfect harmony between husband and wife as such, which we all would like to see. But uh, you have God the Father who's the head. Uh, he's the mastermind. We have Christ as the administrator. I think Paul brings this out very well in 1 Corinthians 12. And we have the Spirit, which is the enabling force. And all of these three persons work together in perfect harmony and unity. Uh, Pastor Bailey has mentioned in the past, and I quote him because there's not many people that move in his gr groove, but he mentioned that seeing the Holy Spirit, the majesty of this third person in the Trinity, that he, was, he had the appearance of being younger than the others in this trinity. And also the point has been made that usually people that are baptized in the Holy Spirit are younger looking and acting because they have this younger member in them. Good news, isn't it? Uh, well, you know, coming from the Anglican Church and looking at some of the old people, you know, they're, like, they're kind of I hope this tape doesn't go to England, but um, <laughs> uh, you know, they look a little starchy. Um, but uh, you know, the Pentecostals have an air of youthfulness, don't you think? And they think younger, uh, they have the Holy Spirit who is younger in them. Now, not saying people that aren't saved. They have the Holy Spirit as well. But when we talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, that's another phase. So we have the thought of Christ as the Word. Um, he's declared to be the living Word. And even in his second coming, in Revelation 19.13, we see that his name is called the Word of God. Jesus said, the words that I speak are spirit and life. He was very God. The worlds were spoken into existence through the word. Um, coming back to John's gospel now, and 1-1, it says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Now the definition here, in the beginning was the word. The definition of the word is logos. Not logo, but in the Greek it's logos. Which is the, you know, the logos is the, uh, the unexpressed, the written word, the thought, the vision, okay? In the beginning there was the logos which is unexpressed, it was, is a vision, a thought, the written word, in the mind of the Father. This is the way I see it. It was in the mind of the Father as to what Christ would be, and then he steps out of the bosom of the Father as the second person in this trinity. And there's not anything that is, that's not made through the second person of this trinity. He's the co-creator of everything. But it begins, it's as though he's in the mind of the Father, and then 
he steps out into the, the expressive word as the express image of the Father. In fact, in Hebrews 1.3, it says, uh, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. The express image of his person, when Christ stepped out of the bosom of the Father, he is, uh, we like to say, a, a carbon copy, it, not perhaps in the physical sense, but the express image of his character and nature. He was the express image of the thought of God, and he expressed it. Now, this is not in the sense of, uh, you know, looks, but it's in the thought of character and nature that he expressed the Father fully. If you have known me, you have known the Father, because I express everything that the Father is. Express image. So, the only begotten. He was brought forth, the only begotten Son of God. The express image of his, everything that God the Father was. Amen. And later called the Son of God. The Son of God. And everything that is was spoken into existence by the living word, the word, the living word that Christ spoke. He spoke it into existence. He made something out of nothing. He declared something out of nothing. I want us to get a good picture of this. He spoke something out of nothing. I mean, Satan has the power of transformation. He can take something and, you know, transform it into something else, but he has something to work with, to begin with, but not God. He is creator. He speaks it into existence. And as we also read in Hebrews 11, 3, <coughs> says, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. He spoke something out of nothing. Something out of nothing. So the worlds were spoken into existence. The worlds, the whole universe was spoken into existence through the Son of God. So he's not just somebody that came into being in Bethlehem. He ever was. He was from the beginning of time. And then this word became flesh. In the will of the Father, he divests himself of all of the glory that's in heaven, and he allows himself to become an embryo in the womb of a woman to become one of us. He takes on flesh and blood so that he can die and so that he can feel the infirmity of mankind. He makes his grand entrance into this world through the womb of a woman. You know, just so we get our doctrine straight. John 1, 14. Where are you, John 1, 14? The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So God becomes man to pay the penalty, to take our place. You know, this is why when people reject the Son of God, they're eternally damned. Reject the offering of the Son of God who paid a tremendous price to redeem us, and to reject that is to choose eternal damnation. You know, God honors his word. He puts the word above his own name. 
It says that in Psalm 138, that he magnifies his word above his own name, which tells you that God's word is absolute, ever settled in heaven. There's no mistakes in God's word. And you know, we should adapt that policy in our own lives, that, that we, what we say, we equate with our own good name. Amen? There used to be a saying about a man is as good as his word. Today, people's word means peanuts because they don't stand by it. We want to be careful that we honor our word, even if it's, even if, you know, we have to smart for it. Amen? And then finally, I know you all like that word, finally. Um, John, in chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, it says, He was in the world, the world was made by him, the world knew him not. He came unto his own, to the Jews. And his own received him not, but as many as received him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. I hope that we can appreciate the privilege that God has given us the privilege of becoming sons of God. He was the Son of God, but He's given us the privilege of becoming sons of God. And to those who continue on, He gives us the power to become the sons of God, the grace to become the sons of God. I'll tell you something, folks. Uh, in fact, I just got a letter from the other side of the world here, just a day ago. And the letter was expressing how that certain ministry over the other side of the world, and it's very popular. You can pick it up on our own. If you have cable, you can pick it up right here. How that this ministry is, is apostate, but it's leading people into damnation. It's, it's denying the true grace. It's saying that we can, once we're in the kingdom, we are in the kingdom. We don't even need to repent again. We don't have to repent. It's all been taken care of. Um, it's talking about how God's grace, God's grace, God's grace covers it all. Listen, God's grace is the power to live a holy life. God's grace is not his tolerance over sin. And so this party was telling me, please, when you come over here, hit that part of the gospel because the church is going apostate and even those who at one time were of Zion are being seduced into an apostasy that's taking them to hell. Paul said, don't be deceived on this point. These kind of people do not go to heaven. To them gave he power to become. We'd have a song people come back. We'll continue on with this in our next session, but bringing many sons to glory. Uh, you know what? Maybe I should just turn to heaven and get my notes, but I do know where it's at. I think I do. In 1 John 3, 1 John 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. 
congregation we call the sons of god